what's going on in Venezuela. And there were um, two uh, Venezuelans having coffee last week. And one said to the other, do you know what socialists used before candles? Electricity. <laughs> You know, as I travel around the world, I, I traveled to many countries that um, had uh, socialist forms of government. And the one thing that struck me more than anything else was the scarcity that resulted. And, um, you know, I, I didn't give it a great deal of thought in terms of how does the form of government uh, match what is in the scriptures, um, at least not initially. But over time, it seemed to me that that was a good question to ask and to investigate. And so this morning I'd like to share with you um, uh, some of the fruits of that study. You know, does the Bible support socialism? Well, first, is socialism in the Bible? You know, there are an awful lot of people who would say that it is. In fact, that that is the natural economic system of the scriptures. And they take that from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 36. That's the proof text. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all, that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who, are, who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. There are many who say, wow, that sounds like communism. Well, instead of proving socialism, or, or more specifically communism, it actually shows that Christians had private property and that they gave out of their love for others, not out of any compulsion or coercion from the government. Christian charity and love are impossible without the concept of private property. If you don't have control over your own property, you cannot make any decision to give it to anyone else. It also uh, is impossible without the concept of personal volition, that you have the will to do it. In socialism broadly, it is the government that has the will to do something. The individual may not be happy about it at all. Also note that there was no government involvement in the distribution of food or wealth in that early Christian community. Now, I was concerned when I saw just a short time ago that 71% of millennials, per one poll, favored socialism, or at least had a favorable view of socialism. I went back and I looked at a variety of polls, and here's one from 2014. And it says, in those who are aged 18 to 24, 58% have a favorable view of socialism, 37% unfavorable. If you jump up to people who are 55 to 64, 70% have an unfavorable view, 23% have a favorable view. And basically, once you get beyond the age of 25, the view tends to skew more and more unfavorable as people get older. Ben Franklin said, uh, we get too soon old and too late smart. And I think we see that with social systems. There is a fundamental problem that people are trying to solve, and that is what to do about the poor. Now, they may get represented as the unequal distribution of wealth, but we have poor amongst us, and what do you do about that? And so, if you take God out of the equation, then you have to come up with some system for caring for that. And people wind up praying to the government instead of to God. And so how can the government provide for these people who have such deep needs? Well, there are many who think 
that Jesus actually would prefer it if the government became the source of all distribution of wealth. Um, the Bar poll in 2016 uh, indicated that 24% of Americans think Jesus would prefer socialism. 16, I'm sorry, 14% think Jesus would prefer capitalism. Now that's broadly, that's just not just by age group. That's across all age groups. And then 62% of Americans are not sure. When asked which candidate's policies most closely align with Jesus, now this is 2016, so this would have been those candidates for president in 2016, a plurality said Bernie Sanders, who was an about socialist. The Hollywood Reporter on 5-16-16 said this, Jesus was apparently a socialist who would support Bernie Sanders for president, as they analyzed the poll. Now most of the folks in this room are older. And, um, you know, we grew up in a time when something like this would be almost impossible to understand. I mean, I, I was leaned on stories of people like Horatio Alger. And today, the average kid has no idea who Horatio Alger was. Well, what is socialism? Uh, there are a couple of definitions. Um, it's any of various economic and political theories advocating collective or governmental ownership of property, natural resources, the means of production, and the distribution of goods. In other words, the government controls production and it controls distribution. Uh, a second definition is a system of society, a group living in which there is no private property. And generally speaking, socialism has as a goal the elimination of private property. And secondly, the means of production are owned and controlled by the state. And then thirdly, it is an intermediate stage of society in Marxist theory that is transitional between capitalism and communism. Now what problem is it trying to fix? Well, according to modern socialists, the underlying problem to be solved is the inequitable distribution of wealth, which is the ultimate cause of social injustice. And since we do have at least one socialist candidate, I thought, well, let me check his website. And here's what he says. The issue of wealth and income inequality is the great moral issue of our time. It is the great economic issue of our time, and it is the great political issue of our time. Okay, so that's important, because what it is saying is that from a socialist mindset, the most critical item is the inequality that exists in income. John Piper, a very gifted Christian teacher, said this, socialism borrows the compassionate aims of Christianity while rejecting the Christian expectation that this compassion not be coerced or forced. I sought to go through the scriptures and come up with a um, couple of basic economic principles. And I concluded that in Galatians chapter six, you really have the heart of what the scriptures teach distilled. The first, and there are two basic parts to that. The first is, in Galatians 6 2, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. That we have a responsibility to look after others, to those who are around us. And it starts with the thought that God owns everything, and he gives it to whomever he chooses. All we have is from God. We are stewards and we're to be co-workers with God. It says that he gives his gifts to those who have much so that they can distribute as co-workers with God to those who have little. You know, I've heard many, um, I've heard many sermons on giving. Usually it's right before they're taking pledges. Um, or it's when a building is being built or something like that. But generosity is encouraged throughout the scriptures. Old Testament, New Testament. But 
what I found is that rarely is it mentioned what a joy it is to give to someone. Someone has a need, and there will always be people all around us who have needs, and we will always have needs. And ultimately, people pray to God to meet their needs, and God uses certain, uses intermediate means, that means us, to care for the needs of others. And what a joy it is to be able to give something that impacts someone else's life. It may be the very thing that makes the difference for their whole lives. Someone who is about to be foreclosed and you give them enough so that they can cover the payment on their house. Someone else who can't go to college because they don't have enough money and you give them something that helps them get in. Uh, someone who struggles just to have the next meal and the joy of knowing that you've made it possible for them to eat or to live. That's the kind of God, the joy that God has, and he just wants us to share it with him. We are to love our neighbors ourselves. We're told that as a commandment. Beyond that, it's repeated multiple times throughout the scriptures. Our resources are to be used to care for those who have needs. There shall be no poor among you, we read over and over again throughout the Old Testament. And the method was purely volitional. There was gleaning, so don't take all of the produce from your entire field. Leave some so that others can just stop by and take it. And so what you have can be available to others. There was the Sabbath year where you just take a rest for a year. There was the Jubilee where loans were forgiven, where poverty was not inherited. Your parents may have lost everything that they inherited, but it will be restored to you in, this, in the Jubilee year. The Jews were also told you were not to charge interest to fellow Jews. And it says the reason, there shall be no poor amongst you. Imagine the people today who struggle with 35% credit card interest and the deep hole of debt that they can't dig out of. Imagine you were the one loaning them the money. Okay, it sounds very different if you went to your neighbor and said, well, I'll charge you 35% home. You know, when I was growing up, 8% was the limit on user. Beyond that, you went to jail. Well, oh, then you went to a loan shark who operated outside the law. Today, it's normal. If somebody is paying 8 or 9% on their credit cards, they think they've got a good deal. There was the widow's list, whether it was amongst the Jews before Christ or in the church after Christ. It was the responsibility of the people to take care of the widows and the orphans who were in their midst. As a matter of fact, James says, True religion is to care for widows and orphans in their time of distress. Care for the ones who cannot care for themselves. We're called to be priests. A priest is someone who intercedes for others. Each of us has a small congregation. They are those that we love, in some cases just those that we know or who know us. And we have responsibility for them to intercede, to intercede before God, to pray, certainly. But when we have the wherewithal to make a difference, it's foolish for us to pray to God when in fact God, if you were sitting here and talking with us, would say, well, I've already given you what you need in order to help that person out. Well, God only rewards giving done willingly, and we're also told cheerfully. He loves a cheerful giver. Greek word is great. It's hilarion, hilarious. God loves hilarious givers. He wants us to enjoy participating in improving the situation of those around us. Not to live for ourselves, but to live for others. So the first principle then is that we're to carry each other's burdens. And the word for burden there is interesting because it's the word for excess burden. Because the second principle 
just a couple of verses later in Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6, verse 5, is that each must carry his own load. And this was a word that was used for the soldier's equipment, the backpack, basically, that each soldier was responsible for carrying. There is a certain amount that is presumed that we must carry ourselves if we are physically able. Work is assumed. Second Thessalonians 3 says, He who does not work does not eat. Caring for your family is assumed. The man who does not provide for his own family is worse than an infidel, we read in 1 Timothy. Private property is assumed. You shall not steal, you shall not covet. These only have meaning if there is such a thing as private property. If it's public property, you should be able to take anything that you want. And compassion is intended. As James said, true religion is to look after widows and orphans in their distress. But we are responsible first for ourselves. And a widow was only put on the widow's list if there were no family at all. Today, families quite often first look to the government to solve any special needs, not to themselves. God will supply. God will give you enough so you can be generous in all circumstances we read in the scriptures. Try me, he says. Well, there are varieties of socialism, and these again are all attempts to resolve the inequalities that exist, which is one way of saying the needs that we see around. Marxist socialism, of course, started by Karl Marx, or founded by Karl Marx. Marx was based on an atheistic and materialistic worldview. So the first presumption is there is no God. Um, human communities are created by the division of labor, he thought. And he believed that the motive force behind all human history is economics. In other words, money drives everything. Now, at the time he wrote, the Industrial Revolution was beginning to change things. The past had been a feudal society. The present for him was uh, the rise of factories, and peasants were working in factories. And he believed that the Industrial Revolution had caused former peasants to work in factories, and that, in essence, they were now slaves in the factory, as before they had been slaves in the fields. And these factories were controlled by powerful taskmasters. He believed that capitalism is a form of economic feudalism since property, wealth, and the means of production were still in the hands of a few. Workers did not rise up, he believed, because they viewed their reward as coming in heaven. Hence, he said, religion is the opiate of the masses. It keeps them from rising up. The promise that one day you'll be rewarded. Therefore, you can do without you. Communism eventually does away with all private property. With the state in control of all wealth, all property, all natural resources, and all means of production. The state, per Marx, then equitably redistributes, and you may have heard this, quote, from all according to their ability to all according to their need. It sounds good until you realize that it is the great leveler and it really begins eliminating the motivation for accomplishing anything. Some fallacies of Marxism. Marxism believes wealth is limited. The rich do not deserve their wealth. They either stole it or their ancestors did. Now this is an interesting thing. Socialism sees the world and sees the economic system as a zero-sum game, meaning there's just so much wealth. Now I used to do business in France, and I can remember going to uh, one company, and we were going to schedule a meeting late in the day, and they couldn't do it, because there was no such thing for them as overtime. At that time, the law in France was you could work 32 hours. Anything more than that, you risked a fine. In other words, you would be penalized for working too many hours. 
And their calculations had indicated that if everybody worked 32 hours, we could maximize the total number of hours if you worked more available for everyone. If you worked more than that, you were cutting into someone else's work time. And there would be fewer people who then had jobs. You see, it was a zero-sum game. It was just so much. And so, if one had more, that means somebody else, by definition, has to have less. Wealth multiplies, in reality, as a result of wise effort. Good um, economies naturally expand and create more wealth. In the scriptures, think of the parable of the talents. The assumption was that you would invest your money and that it would grow. You know, the whole concept of the stock market presumes an expanding economy. Well, it's the same number of people, it's the same number of hours, potentially, if everybody were working. And what happens? The economy expands. One person does well, that results then in them hiring people to work for them. New jobs. Whether it's just mowing the lawn, or painting the house, or starting a company and hiring people. I know in my lifetime, um, you know, there was a time I was an employee of a company. I didn't have a clue how companies got started. When I started my first company, I didn't have a clue how companies got started. <laughs> it was just me in the basement behind the furnace with a business card and a phone and, uh, you know, just uh, my desk was there behind the furnace and um, in a very tiny basement. And I really didn't know how to get started, but I believe God was calling me to start a business. So it grew. It became international. And along the way, I hired a lot of people. And there were people who wound up being able to buy homes, to put their kids through school, um, to be able to pay for medical needs, to get insurance, any number of different things. Okay, it was just a simple decision made, I believe led by God, to start a company. Raw capitalism. And it had an impact. Without, and we, we never, unfortunately, I fell into one of those minority groups that gets no help, white male. Um, you know, but, which is perfectly fine, by the way. They, um, and I'm not at all opposed to helping people who have deep needs. And I believe that when you start a company, it either develops your faith in yourself or your faith in God. And in my case, I didn't have a firm belief in myself, you know, just, uh, and I saw the miracles of God. Marxism believes the value of a product is determined by the amount of labor needed to produce it. The reality is the value of a product is determined by the marketplace. Think the pearl of great price. The value was determined based upon the value ascribed to it. How much is gold worth? Well, you can't eat it. If I gave you a bar of gold, you couldn't do much with it. If you carry it in your car, it's just going to eat up a little more gas on your way home. But it's worth the value that people ascribe to it. Government has the responsibility, according to Marx, of caring for the needs of the people. People should be taxed as needed to redistribute wealth to those in need. The biblical view is that the family and the church care for the needs of the people. All have the responsibility of voluntarily caring for their neighbors. Love your neighbor and yourself. According to Mark's government, if run by the right people, will be free from corruption. Socialism has failed, and you'll hear this said, um, by the talking heads on TV, has failed because the wrong people have tried and failed. Atheism, according to the Bible, is by definition self-interested, which runs in the face of sharing with others. And yet, socialism at its core, Marxism in particular, presumes that we will all share with one another. But by definition, the atheist does not desire altruism. The 
fool, according to Psalm 14, 1, has said in his heart, there is no God. A foolish idea. Eliminating private property, according to Marx, will eliminate the major cause of conflict. And yet the scriptures say this in James 4, 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? In other words, it's not money, it's not anything extrinsic. Our problem is right here in the human heart. And no political system will solve that. No economic system will solve that. Now, there's another form of socialism that many people believe is a really right-wing. Nazism. National socialism. It is a leftist form of socialism in which the government determines and directs what will be produced. But unlike communism, the means of production largely remain in private hands. The German and the Russian systems of socialism have in common, this is according to Ludwig von Mises, who was an Austrian-born economist who um, fled Nazi Germany, came to the U.S. German and Russian systems of socialism have in common the fact that the big government has full control of the means of production. It decides what shall be produced and how. It allots to each individual a share of consumer goods for his own consumption. The difference between the systems, he wrote, is that the German pattern maintains private ownership of the means of production and keeps the appearance of ordinary prices, wages, and markets. But in fact, the government directs production, all production decisions, curves entrepreneurship and the labor market, and determines wages and interest rates by central authority. Market exchange, says Mises, is only a sham. I was stunned some years back. We had uh, an employee, a contractor, that we um, wanted to hire in Switzerland. And he was going to stay in Switzerland. And um, he had to get approval by the Swiss government to do the particular job that we wanted him to do. In other words, they were determining how many people could be in each type of job. That's surprising. I was surprised. Ultimately, after several months, he wound up getting his approval. I never thought about those things. That they would get down to the point in some countries of determining how many people can be painters, how many people can be computer programmers, how many people can be, well, whatever. But when the government controls it, they can determine to control whatever they choose to control. Now, Hitler's view of Nazism was this, that true social justice, he said, it is a typical Aryan characteristic. Jews, he said, merely pretend to support equality and social justice. And then he said about Marxism, he said, Marxism is ersatz socialism contrived by Jews to mobilize the workers against the enemies of the Jews, such as his own impending national socialist regime. George Gilder wrote an excellent book a few years back, The Israel Test. And in it he says that socialism everywhere expresses envy of excellence by treating the works and wealth of the successful as the wages of sin. Nazism simply specifies the sin as the result of a Jewish conspiracy. The real issue between, is between admiration of achievement versus envy and resentment of it. Now, I have family, um, or actually my wife has family, in Scandinavia. And it is not at all uncommon to hear people complaining about others who are wealthy. It is viewed as they must have stolen it. They got it unjustly, somehow, some way. Who do they think they are? Why are they so special? And it had not occurred to me until I read Gilder's book that 
socialism generally views things as a zero-sum game. And that's when I started thinking about my own experiences traveling around the world and visiting various socialist countries. I would go to London, and virtually every time I was there, another hospital was being closed down because the government was trying to determine um, how they could afford to meet the needs of all the people. We're used to the idea that here, if you want an MRI, you go to hundreds of places probably within 30 miles of here. Well, if it's all centrally controlled, there is one MRI, and you have to allocate the area or the region that it's for. And so what I would read about in the paper was not just the closing down of a hospital because it can no longer be afforded, but the discussions that were being had about whether or not um, an MRI or some other type of, uh, of service um, could be implemented in some area. And then there were the complaints that one was being favored over another, one area was being favored over another, one group of people were being favored over another. The real issue, according to Yoder, is between admiration of achievement versus envy and resentment of it. And if you have central control, you need incredible brilliance to properly distribute. In fact, you would need the brilliance of God to actually do it right. Socialism, it turns out, because of this very problem of a zero-sum type game, spawns anti-Semitism and also antagonism to faith generally. According to Gilder, Israel defines the line of demarcation on one side Marshaled at the United Nations and in universities around the globe are those who see capitalism as a zero-sum game in which success comes at the expense of the poor and the environment. Every gain for one party comes at the cost of another. On the other side are those who see the genius and the good fortune of some as a source of wealth and opportunity for all. Another form of socialism. Fascist socialism, I would say, well, fascism is extreme right way. Well, in reality, left wing I mean, it comes from where the different parties sat. If you were to go back to uh, to France some years back, um, and the leftists, uh, the socialists, basically, uh, sat on the left. Um, Mussolini. Was, the, was a leading member of the Italian Socialist Party who propounded some thoughts that ultimately became fascist socialism. Three core principles of fascism, and you tell me if this is socialism, if this is left wing or right wing, and here they are. He said, everything in the state in other words, the government is supreme and the country is all-encompassing and all within it must conform to the government, he said. Nothing outside the state, meaning every human worldwide should ultimately be part of the state and submit to the government. Fascism ultimately expects globalism. And finally, nothing against the state. The government determines truth. Question of government is not to be tolerated. All dissent is by definition wrong. Dissenters cannot be allowed to live and thwart the state. Does that sound very appealing? We're used to the individual being the center. In our form of government, it is very much about the individual and personal rights. And the Bill of Rights starts out the most critical section of the Constitution. The doctrine of fascism, written in 1935, states this clearly. The fascist conception of the state is all-embracing. Outside of it, no human or spiritual values can exist, much less have any value. value. Fascism interprets, develops, and potentiates the whole life of a people. The church then, faith, is subsumed under the government. Note that fascism is a form of socialism and not a right-wing philosophy. 
The central government controls everything, and, and it, this is diametrically opposed to conservatism and capitalism, which emphasize the individual. Rugged individualism has no place in a fascist society. Now, there's also democratic socialism. And many would refer to what you see in Europe as democratic socialism. In reality, most of the revenues derived in those economies come from capitalism. Mercedes-Benz, BMW, and so on. BASF, um, and I could go on. Bayer, large German companies buy and sell on our stock market. Um, great debt has come in Europe as they have attempted uh, socialist experimentations in parts of their economy. The Norwegians have done extremely well, but they have massive amounts of oil. And yet their taxes are still in the 70% range. Democratic Socialists, and this is off of the website of the Democratic Socialists of America, so you can check it out for yourself. Democratic Socialists believe that both the economy and society should be run democratically through elected officials and their appointees. In other words, the difference is it's not someone coming in and taking over the government. It is uh, people jointly electing someone to run the government and then control the means of production. So that it's through elected officials and their appointees that public needs are met. And the goal is not to make profits for a few, but to meet the needs of the many. To achieve a more just society, many structures of our government and economy must be radically transformed, they would say. And then this, in the short term, we can't eliminate private corporations, but we can bring them under greater democratic control. So the goal then is to eliminate private corporations. And there is a fallacy that exists, and you'll hear it over and over, that somehow corporations are these independent entities, fundamentally evil, but in this case, a necessary evil for the short term. Corporations are just groups of people who have assembled for some joint purpose that hopefully results in profit so that they can continue to pay the workers and so that they can continue to grow, so they can continue to be a benefit. Um, the government could use regulations and tax incentives, they say, to encourage companies to act in the public interest and outlaw any destructive activities such as exporting jobs to low-wage countries and polluting our environment. In other words, and as you go through, you see, part of their approach is to criminalize behavior that is not in and of itself criminal, but is viewed as criminal, because the thought is that it is contributing to inequality. And profit contributes to inequality. Most of all, and this is their words, socialists look to unions to make private business more accountable. Note that democratic socialism is itself an oxymoron. Democracies are a form of distributed government, while socialist states are centrally controlled. Hence, Marx viewed it as an interim state between capitalism and full-blown Marxism or communism. Money is probably the most spiritual thing you're going to find in the Bible. God says you cannot serve both God and money. He's placing money up as an alternative idol, as someone else to worship. Now you may think, how can that be? How can that be? Well, think about this. Someone who has need may go and pray to God. Someone else may write their senator or their congressman and say, I need the government to step in here. Please, Mr. Senator. Please, Mr. Congressman. And then we pray to our government. Oh, we don't present it that way, but isn't that exactly what we're doing? Well, you can't serve both God and money. Um, the gleaning laws that we talked about earlier, 
that is part of God's solution. That the overflow of what we have should be able to benefit others. There's tithing for the poor. You know, tithing, you hear quite often a lot about tithing to the church. But in fact, there were three tithes in the scriptures for the Old Testament. 10% went to the Levites. Those were the ones who had the responsibility of serving in the temple. 10% went to the poor. And another 10% every third year was used in each town to throw a big party. True. In fact, God was probably the biggest party giver of all time. He had seven feasts all year long. You had to take a break. And in an agrarian society, take a break. Every the Sabbath day, take a break. Wow. Psalm 82, that says the man who gives to the poor. We also read, a gift to the poor is a loan to God. You know, God says, I will repay, saith the Lord. So when you give to the poor, Jesus said, whatsoever you've done for the least of these, my brethren, you've done for me. We've confused things many times and thought that the ritual of attending church service, Bible study, or whatever, is our entire duty as followers of Christ. In fact, our duty is to care for those around us. True religion is to care for widows, orphans, those who have need and their distress. The parable of the Good Samaritan makes it clear that religious orthodoxy is not a substitute for true compassion. Biblical scriptures are there against stealing and against coveting your neighbor's goods. In Acts 4, we did read that everything was shared, but private property was maintained and giving was not coerced. Giving presumes ownership. You have to own it first to be able to give. The word agape is an interesting word. It's the word that is translated love. And now I'll buy these three things, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. King James Version translates it as charity. Now I'll buy these three, faith, hope, and charity. Because it was a type of love that was totally self-giving without any expectation of getting anything returned. It was not a loan. Here, let me loan this to you to get you through your hard time. It was a gift. Agape is the Greek word translated love throughout much of the New Testament. And it's a self-sacrificing love with no expectation of benefit. Some other reasons socialism is not Christian. It's based on a materialistic worldview. Karl Marx said earlier, said this, religion is the opium of the masses. Not a very positive view of biblical faith. Socialism punishes virtue and rewards indolence and sloth from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Socialism endorses public theft. The state owns all property and they will take it as, as uh, the state sees fit. And that starts at some point and it begins with confiscation of property. As you study the history of socialist states, that's where they started. They took the property from the people. Socialism encourages envy and class warfare. There's another interesting quote from a socialist candidate's Facebook page. Let us wage a moral and political war against the billionaires and corporate leaders on Wall Street and elsewhere whose policies and greed are destroying the middle class of America. Visit Venezuela and look for the middle class. Socialism does not expand the middle class, it shrinks it. Capitalism makes it possible for anyone to rise above their current circumstances. Socialism seeks to destroy marriage and the family. Now you may question that. Here's what Frederick Engels said. The single family ceases to be the economic unit of society. Private housekeeping is transformed into a social industry. The care and education of the children becomes a public affair. If you're not familiar with Frederick Engels, he and Karl Marx knew one another extremely well. They, um, 
Socialism, me, socialism is inherently anti-God, anti-family, and anti-church. God is the ultimate competition to socialism. It attempts to correct the faulty distribution of God's blessing. People beseech the state instead of God for sustenance, blessing, and solving of problems. God has given his gifts for the poor to the wealthy, and he has done that so that the wealthy might be his co-workers in blessing the poor, not just the wealthy. Anyone who has anything can share with someone who has less. Traditional marriage and the church are enemies of socialism since they compete for control of children, caring for the needs of the poor, and guiding the minds of the masses. A couple of quick definitions. Socialism. You have two cows, the state takes one and gives it to your neighbor. Communism. You have two cows, the state, the state takes both and gives you some milk. <laughs> Fascism. You have two cows, the state takes both and sells you some milk. Nazism. You have two cows, the state takes both and shoots you. <laughs> Democratic Socialism, you have two cows, the state takes both, kills one for being too big, milks the other, and then throws the milk away. <laughs> Capitalism, you have two cows, you sell one and buy a bull. Your herd multiplies. You hire help and the economy grows. You ultimately sell the entire herd and you retire on the income. <laughs> Thank you for your time this morning. Let's just have a good prayer. Heaven, uh, we thank you for the great nation in which we live and the wisdom of our founders. I pray, Lord, that um, you might um, maintain a society here that worships you and has the freedom to do that. I pray in Jesus' name.